Hey, what's up, guys? This is Cody Brockway back with yet another episode of Brockway's Vinyl Bites. Woohoo! Yeah, and I'm actually wearing the the T-shirt of my store, Second Chance Records. That's right. This is the record store that I own out here in Caledonia, Ontario, uh, Canada. Uh, the address is 20 Argyle Street North, Caledonia, Ontario, Canada. That's <laughs> like I just said. And the shirt says, "That's what I do. I listen to vinyl and I forget things. Ain't that the damn truth?" We got a turntable on here with a record that actually says Second Chance Records, the name of my business. So come on in and see us. And um, that kind of leads us into today's episode of Essential Listening for this wonderful classic prog rock, maybe metal band, depending on who you are. Uh, They have lots of heavy moments in there, that's for sure. And they were absolutely instrumental in helping out the um, uh, metal genre as well. And uh, maybe you want to come get some of these albums from my store. If you end up being a fan or are already a big fan of them. But anyway, that band today is King Crimson. You could probably tell from the title. But I've picked out five King Crimson albums today that I think totally kick ass. Obviously, if you put me to it, I could pick more than five. But for the essential listening, I whittled it down and picked just some of the really best stuff. And if you're if you don't really know who King Crimson is and you're looking to take that plunge into the dis- discography... Uh, you've come to the right place. Uh, these are definitely five that will get you started in the right direction. So we're going to go chronological order of the five. And uh, we'll start with 1969. The record that changed everything for a lot of music that was not the Beatles. In the Court of the Crimson King, everybody. This is King Crimson. This is their first album. Sorry for the glare. It's because of the sleep. you got to keep the records protected, you know. This is the 200 gram uh, vinyl uh, reissue. The lineup of King Crimson would change many times over the years, but uh, the initial lineup was Greg Lake, who would go on to form Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, um, Robert Fripp, Ian McDonald, who would make more appearances in the King Crimson years down the road, Michael Giles, and Peter Sinfield. This record changed a lot of things in music when it came out. It was heavy, but it was progressive. They they played jazz, they played metal, they played soft music, they played it all in different time signatures and just did all this great stuff. And But it was like, it was a mixture of things like you'd never heard music sound like this before. And that record still to this day is very ahead of its time and people are still catching on to it 54 years later. And uh, you know, it's one of the most influential albums of all time for sure. Uh, you know, this is just a just a classic album in the Court of the Crimson King. We got 21st Century Schizoid Man, I Talk to the Wind, Epitaph. What are some of the other songs on here? I'm just going by memory. Um, so that's those three songs I just mentioned are side one. Then side two is Moonchild, which is kind of a long song, you know, and so is uh, the Court of the Crimson King, all classic King Crimson. Um, just five songs, but the songs are lengthy and they are worth your time and attention. So... That is In the Court of the Crimson King, the first album from King Crimson. Next up, as I mentioned to you before, King Crimson went through a lot of lineup changes. Sometimes Robert Fripp would just go, okay, because he was kind of the the brain of King Crimson, like the head honcho, right? And he'd kind of just go, okay, that's enough. And he'd just retire the band for like seven, like ten years. And then he would just randomly bring them back with a whole new different lineup, um... Anyway, we'll get we'll get to that. But the next record that we have here is from 1973, and this is the lineup of John Wetton, who would go on to form Asia, uh, Bill Bruford from Yes, uh, Robert Fripp, of course, David Cross, and Jamie Muir. This album is Lark's Tongues and Aspic. This is one of my all-time favorite albums. First time I heard this thing, it changed my freaking life. Totally blew my mind. Um, this is just an absolutely incredible album. The songs on this, uh, we got Lark's Times and Aspect Part 1 to open up the album, Book of Saturday and Exiles, that's side one. Side two is Easy Money, The Talking Drum, Lark's Tongues and Aspect Part 2. Yeah, this is, um, you know, this is God tier King Crimson along with the first album for sure. Um, this is just, it's, it's really, truly an incredible work of art album, um, what can I say? You know, you got to go check it out. <laughs> the drumming, the playing, the writing, everything on it is just, just some of the best, um, just some of the best music 
out there. And speaking of some of the best music out there, that brings us to 1974. This would be the last album that King Crimson would do until 1981, when Robert Fripp would bring them back with a whole new lineup. Uh, of course, I'm talking about Red. This is back when they were... Uh, they had sort of got rid of Jamie Muir and they just turned into a three-piece for a brief period of time. But they have uh, they have guests here. David Cross on violin, Mel Collins, he played the soprano sax. Ian McDonald, he, I mentioned him from the first album on alto saxophone. Uh, Robin Miller on the oboe and Mark Schurig cornet, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, that's what it says there. <laughs> On the very bottom, right around here. Anyway, this is a fantastic album. Um, what do we got on here? We got Red, Fallen Angel, One More Red Nightmare, Providence, and Starless. This is another game changer album. And um, while you're at it, uh, Neil Morse and Mike Portnoy did a cover of Starless. And it's absolutely fantastic. It's on one of Neil Morris's cover albums. And uh, definitely go check that out, too. Um, but, yeah, great band. This is a really heavy, dark album. Uh, great uh, great drumming. Um, great musicianship all around. Um, Bill Bruford was really experimental with his, per with his percussion and his drum kit. There's a cymbal that sounds kind of like it's a garbage can lid, even though it's like a china. But, you know, anyway... Just go check it out. The songs are epic. One more Red Nightmare, Fallen Angel. It's some of my favorite King Crimson stuff on this album. Just excellent. Just excellent. They were firing on all cylinders. Definitely heavy prog metal. It's kind of the birth. King Crimson kind of birthed that whole genre, that whole movement. That would pick up traction over the years. So that brings us to 1981 when King Crimson would reform the band with a whole new slew of members, except Bill Bruford was uh, back in the lineup because he's so damn awesome. And, you know, John Wetton was doing the Asia thing and blah, 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 blah. This is one of their best albums, and uh, on any given day, this could be my favorite King Crimson album. I could change all, like, I could just pick my number one, depending on that day, from any of these five records for sure. Uh, but this is King Crimson's Discipline. So we got Adrian Ballou, who is a touring member of um, Frank Zappa's band, as well as Talking Heads around the same time. Um, Robert Fripp, of course. Tony Levin, who is uh, you know now in Peter Gabriel's band. But I actually, I guess he was at this point, too. He was in Peter Gabriel's band and about 100 others, too. And uh, he's kind of like the Mike Portnoy of bass. Um, and Bill Bruford on drums. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Uh, if you're a Tool fan watching this, um, there's a video somewhere on YouTube of Danny Carey sitting in the studio around their time that they were doing the Anima album. And uh, there's a guy there interviewing him, and they're talking about music, I guess, that influenced Danny. And he puts on this CD, and he puts on the track Discipline, the last track on this album. And he's like, listen to the time signature changes in this. Bruford, man, he was so crazy, you know, playing 5-8 with one hand and 4-4 four, four with the other. And... The way it matches up with the guitars and oh yeah it's just it's prog excellence really and uh it's this is also another one of those avant-garde these are kind of all avant-garde albums but this is like this is really something else and the two albums that come after it which were beat and uh, three of a perfect pair uh are sort of similar in the same vein and they're also worth checking out but this is the one i picked uh, we got elephant talk frame by frame mate coup de Sai. beautiful song uh, in Discipline, Thelahan Jinji, The Sheltering Sky, and of course the song Discipline. Now, funny thing, this album was produced by King Crimson and Rhett Davies. Now, about four or five years ago in my store, Second Chance Records, uh, this young British woman came in with a friend of hers, and she said, I'm actually from the UK, but, um, but I'm, uh, I'm just visiting some family and stuff who live down here in this area. I said, oh, cool. And she said, uh, my uncle was Rhett Davies, and... Uh, he produced the band Talk Talk. And I'm like, okay, I kind of know that name, but I can't really pinpoint where I know it from. This was at the time. And uh, her name was Lily Davies, I should say. And, uh, and I said, what's your uncle's credentials? And I, I looked it up and, oh my God, this guy did production with Genesis on the Selling England by the Pound record and a slew of others, including Talk Talk, like she mentioned. But this is the one that really stuck out to me. And we had the record in the store at the time. And I said, oh my God. 
Do you know that your uncle produced one of my favorite albums of all time? And I pulled out King Crimson's Discipline and she said, I've never heard of it. I've never heard of this before. And I was like, oh my God. And I put it on for her immediately and she loved it. She bought the record and brought it home. And uh, just thought I would share that story with you. This is my personal in connection here. (laughs) Anyway. This is one of my favorite albums, people. If you haven't heard it before, I highly suggest you stop the video right now, go listen to this, then come back, because it is freaking fantastic. I could spend the rest of the day or the rest of the night talking about this, but we're going to have to move on to the next one eventually. So we're going to do that. The final one here. So again, after Discipline, Beat, and Three of a Perfect Pair, Robert Fripp would retire the band for 10 years until 1995 when they would come back with the Thrack album. Yeah, so this has Tony Levin, it's going by memory here, Adrian Ballou, Bill Bruford, Pat Mastelotto, Adrian Ballou, Pat Mastelotto, Tony Levin, Robert Fripp, obviously, and Bill Bruford. It's the double drummer thing that they were doing there for a while. And I think there might be Yako Yaksek on this album as well. But uh, anyway, this is another favorite album of mine. This album is called Thrack. It's from 1995. Yes, this is the 40th anniversary box set with the uh, with the 16 CDs, including some remixes and uh, you know surround sound mixes, demo tapes, live stuff, all that fun stuff. But uh, uh, lots of great songs on this: Sex, Sleep, Eat, Drink, Dream, Dinosaur, Thrack. Uh, really really great album super heavy and having the two drummers going at it at the same time especially when you put on the surround sound version awesome 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 love king crimson and love like all the lineups have something even there's plenty of lineups that i didn't mention here um that were not on these albums that are all worth checking out because king crimson in any of its incarnations has a lot of cool stuff to say I saw them in 2019 with my dad and some friends, and uh, no Bill Bruford, but uh, there was Pat Mastelotto, Bill Rieflin, and Gavin Harrison on the drums, and it was just awesome. Gavin Harrison's from Porcupine Tree. We'll do a video on them someday. I love that band, Stephen Wilson, but uh, yeah, yeah, love me some King Crimson. They were fantastic live, so cool to see, and especially with the three drummers. You'd think, oh, well, three drummers, that'd be pretty rackety. No, no, it wasn't. Number one, I'm a drummer, so hey, don't be shit-talking us. Don't be giving the... I heard all the drummer jokes, okay? <laughs> no, uh, but for real. Um, they found this perfect balance of, you know, they'd play all together at certain parts, but then they would also trade off parts, and they would just know when to when to come in and you know it was really well rehearsed really well practiced that was one of the things that bill bruford said when he left yes and joined king crimson he said with yes everything was so meticulous and worked out and with king crimson you just had to know (laughs) do with that what you will but that's just part of bill bruford's genius and robert fripp too uh anyway that whole band is a band of geniuses always has been and always will be you know any you know any lineup member change that they do will serve the band well because uh, they're in good hands. Well, anyway, thank you so much for watching. This has been another episode of Essential Listening on Brockway's Vinyl Bites, and we'll be back with more to rock with you again soon. Rock on! Yeah! (laughs) Happy listening, folks.